Welcome to all of you. I hope that you can, uh, can see us both on the screen. Um, my name is Stephen Platten and I'm uh, acting as the host today from Berwick. I hope you all enjoyed the glorious pictures of Berwick before we started. Um, and I do hope that very soon we can uh, welcome you to see them in reality if you don't live here. Um, I do live here and um, I've known Stephen for a while, so that's one of the reasons why I'm introducing him. Before I come on to do that, just to say that we are very grateful this year that uh, a number of local businesses have helped support the festival. And I'd like to give thanks particularly to Shunters, uh, uh, removal company and uh, carriers um, who have supported us and indeed who helped me and my wife, my wife and I to get here um, when we first moved. Stephen, welcome. Um, Thank you. <laughs> It's a great delight um, to be interviewing you. We've known each other for nearly 30 years now, I think, and uh, yes, my goodness. <laughs> yes. seen each other in different guises and different uh, roles over those years. Um, just perhaps we might do a little bit of um, introduction there. Um, you're from, um, you're actually, I think, speaking today from that part of England from whence you first came, is that right? That is, uh, I'm speaking to you from Sussex. Uh, which is where I grew up, and uh, uh, it is, of course, uh, I don't know whether I dare say this in the presence of people from Berwick, it's God's own country, um, and, uh, and, and, and at the moment rather beautiful and autumnal. It's, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I am normally in London. And then um, after that, you were at school um, fairly nearby, and you um, then on to Oxford, where you read PPE and all languages, was it? Uh, well, I started by reading languages. I switched to PPE after a couple of terms. Yeah. And both those things, in a way, have uh, been of great um, assistance to you for, on a very interesting career. Because when you left Oxford, the first thing you did, did you then go um, straight into um, business? No, I, I went into what is now DFID. It was then called something else. Um, so I joined the civil service because I wanted to work with what we would now call emerging markets or, develop, or developing countries. Um, and in a way, that interest in, in those sorts of countries, those sorts of societies in the stage, state of development have been, is the kind of continuing thread in what otherwise looks like a rather serendipitous career. <laughs> Well, perhaps serendipitous, but nonetheless, um, taking you some, through some extraordinary uh, um, roles and also amazing list of places, because I think you also went on to do some a, a further degree in, um, in the USA. I did. I did a master's degree in uh, uh, actually at, the, at MIT um, in Boston. Um, uh, I, I luckily got a fellowship which paid for me to do that. So... Um, in the very early in the early 1970s, I spent very agreeable years in Boston, and got to know something of that extraordinary country. Um, one of the features of that particular fellowship, it now no longer exists, but uh, uh, it was that they required you to do about eight weeks travel around the USA um, sometime in the course of your studies. So I remember an extraordinary eight-week um, holiday with my wife and a then 10-month-old older daughter, um, where we drove from one side of the country to the other and then down and along the bottom and back up. And we did, I think it was 35 states. Um, and that perspective on America was, uh, was actually life-changing in many ways. And, and then after that, was it from that you went on to uh, McKinsey, the management consultants and so on? Yes, I, I joined McKinsey after about, I suppose, about five years of the, of the, of the civil service of, of DFID, of ODA, as it was then called, um, and did uh, four years in McKinsey, based in their London office, but, but, but based in a rather loose sense, because I spent time in their New York office for a, for a year or so, so that was my second sojourn in America, and also a year in Saudi Arabia, uh, which was really rather different. And furthermore, this was Saudi Arabia in its very early days of emergence as a, as a, as a physically modernized country. I, we lived in Riyadh at a time when Riyadh's population was probably um, 5%, maximum 10% of what it is now. And when there were still big open sewers running down the streets and there was no refuse collection, that was done by uh, roaming goats. It was a very different world from the, from the image we now have of Saudi Arabia. Um, 
and that was a you know another uh, you know, extraordinary experience really that I was very fortunate to have. Um, so McKinsey got me out and about a bit, even though I was based in their London office. And was it from there that you then went uh, went on to HSBC? Yeah, that's right. And, and we moved to Hong Kong. I, I was sitting in my office in London, minding my own business. I get a call from a headhunter. Um, might I be interested in working for a, quotes, dynamic Far East-based financial institution? And I it might be. And, and we got into the conversation. And at the end of a series of interviews and this and that, uh, we went to Hong Kong. And I thought I was going maybe for, well, I thought I was probably going for four years. I signed a two-year contract. And uh, on the principle, you don't do anything just for two years. I thought four, but then it turned out to be six, eight, ten, twelve, and we came back from Hong Kong, still with HSBC, when it moved its headquarters to London. Um, uh, so we had that uh, twelve years experience of living in Hong Kong, both then and thereafter, travelling a lot around Asia, and, and Asia became really the, the part of the world outside of Europe that I kind of, in a sense, know best. Although it's also true to say that you never really get to know. Asia. It is, it's a huge, it's very um, heterogeneous, it's, it's not a one thing, um, um, and you could, you could spend several lifetimes really g g uh, getting to know Asia. So anybody who claims they know Asia is kidding themselves and you, uh, but we did um, see a lot of it, and I, I have travelled uh, more than many people have had the, for, good, fortune, uh, had the good fortune of doing that. Um, uh, around um, uh, both the obvious parts of Asia, the big, the big commercial cities, but also quite a lot of its its more um, its its further reaches as well. And uh, I mean, I can remember you being the group treasurer, and then eventually uh, the chief executive, and finally the the chairman of uh, HSBC. And uh, that in itself also has uh, given you not just Hong Kong, as it were, but so many places. I remember on one occasion you were staying with us. When we were in Yorkshire, and uh, you were going off the, the the afternoon you left us to Mexico, so uh, you've yeah, I've been, well. <laughs> and so the things you've done have taken you around quite a lot of the world, really. Yes, that they, they have actually, and um, and then I um, went on after that to um, do another another completely unexpected thing, which was to be asked to be trade minister in the coalition government. This is the Cameron Clegg government in those balmy days before anybody talked about Brexit very much. Um, and when life seemed a lot simpler than it does now. Um, but, but of course being trade minister, like being an international banker meant that you were kind of traveling uh, an enormous amount. And, and in, as the intensity of the travel was even greater then. So there was a three year period when I was in 56 different countries in the course of three years. Um, not uh, something yeah. I necessarily recommend to anybody. <laughs> um, yeah. And in an odd way, because, because we must move ourselves on in a moment to, uh, to books, because afterwards a literary festival. But in a way, what we've just heard you describing over those years um, is mirrored to some extent in the, uh, the various uh, publications that you've written and so on. Uh, in as much as, as uh, if I look back and see the various subjects you've chosen, the canvas gets wider and wider and wider. And, we might just talk about that again in a minute. So I, I've got a note of about five books that you've published over the years. The first one, I think, was called Seeing God, Seeing Mammon, which was um, about what you might, I think, expect, although you might say a bit more in a minute. And then something more um, uh, focused directly on economics, uh, a good value, before you moved on to a um, great book on Germany, The Reluctant Meister, and then The European Identity, and with the human odyssey, East, West, and the search for universal values, uh, we've moved across the whole of Eurasia. Is that a fair description of your um, pilgrimage? Yeah, it is. I mean, uh, the, the, these are, this is all the work of an amateur, to be clear. Um, but, uh, but, I, but I've been interested in Europe um, for a long time, and, for Ger and in Germany in particular, and I've always had always wanted to write a book about Germany, and I, uh, I did. Uh, write a write the book that you referred to, the Reluctant Meister. Um, I, I chose that title with some some um, trepidation, really. Uh, the, the, it came not long after the Economist had produced an argue, uh, an article um, called the, about Germany in the New Europe, and they entitled it the Re Reluctant Hegemon. Uh, 
I thought that was unfair. I thought there was absolutely no sense in which Germany uh, is or wishes to be the hegemon of the modern Europe. Um, but the first word was right, reluctant, and, uh, and I was intrigued by this notion that the largest country in Europe and the most successful, in many ways, the most successful economy in Europe, um, now the geographic centre of the United Europe, um, is so reluctant to assume the position of uh, amongst the leadership of the European project, let me put it that way, um, that, it, that, that, that so naturally belongs to it. So I wrote this book uh, exploring the background to the German self-awareness, the German identity in, the mo in modern times. And because I've always been interested in history and in literature and philosophy, I kind of delved into the, the sorts of thought streams that have, that have produced German literature down the centuries um, and enjoyed it enormously. It's a book that's um, sold I think it would be fair to say modestly in this country, but really quite well in Germany. It got translated into Germany, German and did quite well there. And um, uh, I enjoyed that balance of history, um, literature and philosophy, a bit about the kind of modern politics and the geopolitics. Um, and that mixture was what I tried to transfer into the, the most recent book, the one you referred to called The Human Odyssey, which is published about a year ago, actually, it's about exactly a year ago. Um, um, but, but transposing that to a broader world stage. Um, and what interests me about the present circumstances that the world finds itself in is that the geopolitics is changing. Um, I'm going to say minute by minute, that would be nonsense, but quite quickly um, from something we've been used to for much of the 20th century into something which is going to look very different in the 21st century. And I wanted to explore how that was occurring, what the cultural backgrounds to the various players on the geopolitical stage are, and the way in which they're increasingly interacting in what is an increasingly globalised world. And in a minute, we'll come back to that, uh, Stephen, if we may, particularly that, uh, that book, uh, as it's the most recent. Um, but just going back for a moment to Germany, what was it that attracted you First of all, you said you'd always been interested in Germany. And what was it particularly that attracted you to, to Germany and its culture then, to write about? It's a good question. And you, 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 you mentioned sort of earlier on, a few minutes ago, that I started studying modern languages at university. Uh, I did indeed, and it was French and German. Um, and I, I switched away from them because the way they were taught at that time meant that you could emerge from three years of university knowing everything there was to know about, um, let's say, the Nibelungen lead in the case of the Germans and the Chanson de Roland in the case of France, or French, um, without being able to have a modern conversation uh, or, or use the language in a modern context. Um, and I didn't do that. But um, uh, the, 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 that exposure, that preliminary exposure to the literature of both countries, in fact, uh, led me to love them both. And I, I do think that uh, I, I love both France and Germany. France is a more popular, it's a more popular thing to say that about France, I think even now, um, whereas I believe that Germany is a, is a relatively less well-known, less appreciated culture and country uh, for us Brits. Um, the fact is it is a lovely country. Uh, there are many very beautiful parts of Germany, lovely towns. I mean, many of the cities were badly damaged, of course, in the war and have that have uh, still bear the imprint of that in so many ways, but there are beautiful market towns all over the place and a culture which is extraordinarily rich, extraordinarily rich in, 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 in poetry, in, 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 in uh, uh, novels, in, in plays, in, and of course in music, we all know about German music. Um, so it's always been a country that's fascinated me. Um, it's 20th century past is a further element in that fascination. I mean, this is, a, uh, to use the cliche, but uh, cliches are often cliches because they're true. This is the country that uh, explored some of the heights of human uh, self-understanding and human culture, and of course, explored the depths too. Um, and that too makes it a fascinating uh, country to, to reflect on and think about and engage with. I speak quite good German. Uh, I've never lost that. Um, so I enjoy kind of um, sort of wandering around a place. My second favourite city in the world, uh, I don't know whether I dare say this, uh, after London, uh, is Berlin. I think it's a quite wonderful, uh, edgy, modern, fast-changing, multicultural sort of city. Great fun.
and we've walked around that city together um, on more than one occasion. And of course, the, um, the I, I entirely with you in terms of how, for some reason, the Brits don't find themselves attracted to Germany until they go there. I think once they go there and see some of those places you've you've mentioned and the extraordinary variety of scenery going from Bavaria, the North German plain, and then across those central um, hills and so on. So let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move on, I think, to, um, to the human odyssey, um, but particularly to your book, The Human Odyssey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> perhaps you'd like to say, um, like to introduce it to us really, um, and then we can reflect a bit more on, um, on what comes out of that. Yes, um, and I started, I suppose, a few moments ago, effectively. The, the, the world stage um, uh, the, the, it, it is one which in the latter part of the 20th century, essentially since the Second World War, was occupied primarily by America and for a while by Russia as the two great superpowers. And then in 1989, um, the, 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 the Russian Empire uh, started to uh, uh, wobble and then collapse, 1991, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, leaving a position which is very rare in human history, where there was one single global superpower on the world stage, America. Um, that, that short period from about 1989 um, is uh, essentially ending about now. Um, because what you're seeing on the world stage is the rise in particular of China uh, alongside America and to some extent some, some other powers too. Um, uh, and so we are moving into a period where I believe in simple terms, I think there's more to be said by, about this, but in simple terms, uh, you're going to see a duopoly of world power uh, going forward for the next number of decades. China has become a remarkable economic force. Um, uh, we, we're all increasingly aware of that. It's becoming a, a country more and more willing to flex its muscles in, in, in pursuit of its own um, political objectives, both domestically and internationally. Um, it's becoming an increasingly powerful military power and uh, an increasingly powerful um, operator in, 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 the, in the cyber space. So it's a phenomenon that's there and I believe there to stay. Um, um, Whatever we think about that fact, I think it's there. It's a fact, and we, we have to kind of address it. Uh, there are people who have argued that um, that this is the takeover of global superpower status from America by China, and that America is it, it, it's like this decline of the West has, has has remorselessly set in and is now irreversible. I don't buy that argument either, um, because I actually think that America is here to stay. Um, it's very easy to underestimate the intrinsic and extraordinary strengths of America if you focus on American uh, on Washington politics. I mean, they are famous for their dysfunctionality, um, and there's no time like a uh, an election three weeks away, but, uh, where where one of the characters is Trump, um, to 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 convey that impression that this is a um, a, a, a governance system that's in that's in terminal decline or racing towards the cliff edge. I don't buy that. Um, the, the, the American government has always been extremely dysfunctional, and of course, it was almost set up deliberately that way by by, by the country's founders. Um, if you look instead at the extraordinary dynamism, dynamism and reinventiveness of the American economy, um, you will see something completely different. I mean, this is the place which which created Silicon Valley. Um, for almost almost from a standing start at about 30 or so years ago, um, at a time when China was just beginning to emerge on the world stage under Deng Xiaoping, um, uh, almost nobody had heard of Silicon Valley, yet now that has created some of the great global platforms, uh, the, the, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, the Amazons, and, and so on. Um, uh, all of this is, in a sense, almost too, too familiar to us. But what it means is that looking forwards, you're going to find global politics going to be shaped to a considerable extent by how China and America engage with each other. Uh, that's not all of the story. Um, I think the how, how China and India engage with each other as the two great behemoths of Asia, the two great, two by, by, by far the largest two countries in the world in terms of population. Um, with a, with a long frontier, which is tense, 
and has been fought over um, um, uh, in varying degrees of intensity uh, for the last um, 50, 60 years. Um, how that uh, relationship uh, works out is also part of the great question about geopolitics in the coming decades. So you, we're, in a, we're in a situation in world history when the tectonic plates have moved rather sharply. We're also at a stage in the world where urbanization is sweeping all through the world. Um, when you look at uh, America and Europe, of course, already heavily urbanized, Japan is pretty heavily urbanized. Russia became urbanized at an absolute breakneck speed uh, in the 1930s, driven, of course, by some extraordinarily uh, brutal uh, uh, methods. Uh, China is becoming urbanized. There is no known case anywhere in the world uh, of a country which, on the, as it develops, does not also urbanize. Um, and there's a long way to go yet. Uh, China's at about, uh, Europe is somewhere between 80 and 90% urbanized. Uh, China's at about 65%. India's at about 35%. Africa is probably at 35%. There is simply no reason to believe that, that as they develop, they won't move towards urbanization. All of that means um, that as the cultures of the world jostle against each other, we become more and more aware of Chinese thought patterns, of Indian thought patterns, um, uh, Middle Eastern thought patterns, uh, the Islamic uh, expansion, the Islamic presence in Europe is something we're becoming more and more aware of than, than was historically the case. All of this means uh, that we live in a more interconnected, more complicated world where it's more and more important to think about how we engage with the worldviews and perspectives of others. And that's why I rather ridiculously ambitiously decided to write the book. That's really helpful. I think giving us sort of something of the canvas. I, I just just following up one or two of the things that have sort of come out, spun off as you've been talking. I wonder whether you'd like to say a bit more about the emergence of India and what that might mean. And I also wonder whether, um, uh, just since you're dealing with Eurasia, um, Japan, of course, has been an interestingly um, effective uh, economic force for a lot of time. And the so-called tiger economies of the uh, what we used to call the Far East, Southeast Asia. I wonder if you met, think a bit, uh, tell us a little bit about how you'd see those fitting into this pattern you described. Well, well, they they, they do fit into the pattern. You 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 quite rightly um, brought it, brought into focus the fact that quite a lot of Asia is quite fast growing. Um, China famously is. Um, India is actually quite fast growing. Um, uh, and then there are a lot of smaller countries, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong itself, um, uh, Singapore, um, and countries we don't think enough about, like Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam, by the way, is a much larger country than most people have an image of it being. I, I, I have occasionally, when I found myself in, in, in um, conversations where there's groups of people, I start asking people to put their hands up as to... Um, uh, how, how, what they think the population of Vietnam is. The answer is about 100 million, uh, which would make it in European context by far the largest European country, if it were one. Um, uh, so uh, there are a number of these powerhouses are, uh, around the Asian continent. Um, and there are also um, sharp differences between them in terms of their uh, worldviews and self-understandings and often long periods of historical animosity between them. Um, uh, for instance, China and Vietnam. Uh, Ch China um, has fought uh, repeatedly, or I should put it the other way around, Vietnam has fought the Chinese off repeatedly um, over, over something like a thousand years. Um, uh, India and China, as I mentioned, they've had their tensions going back a long way. Um, uh, Korea, of course, has the, the particular dynamic of North Korea um, as a state which is clearly... Um, exists by, by, by on sufferance really from China um, and to some extent from Russia perhaps. And then you mentioned Japan. Um, uh, and Japan's interesting because people forget that Japan is still the world's third largest economy uh, after the US, still the biggest just, and China, uh, next biggest and probably about to take, overtake the US. Japan is the next largest economy in the world, and there is no country in the world that is more technologically sophisticated than Japan. Um, Japan uh, sits on a chain of islands off the coast of the Chinese mainland. Uh, we're all aware of the 20th century history. 
um, we're probably less aware that in the um, in, in the uh, 13th century, China, um, then under the Mongol leadership of the Yuan Dynasty, tried to invade Japan. Um, and indeed, they sent a fleet which was dispersed by a hurricane. Um, if that sounds familiar in, a, in the context of the English and the Armada, well, that's because it is a similar sort of story. Um, and that e episode in Japanese history is still present in the Japanese mind. Uh, uh, and in fact, as a, as a sort of twist of 20th century irony, um, um, the hurricane that dispersed the Chinese fleet was known as a divine wind or a kamikaze, a word, of course, which has taken on a different significance post the, from the Second World War. So Japan remains an extraordinary country, both, both, both it's sophisticated and economically important and very different from others. And its self-understanding and its culture, um, uh, I, I do try to explore in the Human Odyssey, as well as the Chinese and the Indians and, and, and the Islamic world and the European world. And, uh, uh, and I do believe that Japan is, I think I would argue, the most different place of, that I've ever been to anywhere. Thank you. That's I love yes, it. I, I had to, if I if I were a cat with nine lives, I'd use another of them uh, to to really understand Japan. I'd, I'd try and learn Japanese. I'd spend time in living in Japan and try to try to get peel peel a few layers of the onion. Yes, uh, you've in, you've mentioned two words there, which I'll pick up if I may. One is the word culture on more than one occasion, and then also you um, uh, you were talking about the divine wind. Um, in relation to that hurricane. Um, I was fortunate enough, rather in the way that one might have done in the 19th century with novels, to read through uh, the Human Odyssey in chunks as you were writing it. And so I, I've got a fairly um, clear notion of the sort of things that you included, but I think it'd be really fascinating for you to hear a bit more about um, the culture, particularly of, of China, but also more widely, and how you would see that having affected where we've got to now. And also, well, it was, yeah, values. We'll come to values later on. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it, where to begin with this? We, and, and I do think culture, including long standing cultural, historical, inter, the, the cultural hinterland of a country, is, is, is very important in shaping sometimes um, sotto voce, if you will. Uh, what what uh, what a country does today, uh, and how how individual citizens of that country think about themselves. Uh, in the case of China, China is a uh, country deeply imbued with Confucianism. Um, Confucianism itself is a um, is is a quite complex tradition. Uh, this is not a matter of the sayings of Confucius, not just a matter of the sayings of Confucius. Um, any more than the Christian tradition is just a matter of the sayings of Jesus recorded in Mark's gospel, for instance. So the, there's, a, there's a whole tradition of thought and writings. Um, uh, and it was increasingly, it, it was imbued by the Taoist tradition, which was, which was uh, uh, goes back even further. Um, and the Buddhist tradition, which came into China from India in at around the turn of the millennium, around the, the same time as time of Christ. Um, and, uh, and so it's, quite, it's a complex world, but in, in headline terms, you could say um, that the Confucian orientation is one which sees the individual in a broader familial or societal or even cosmic context. And it contrasts therefore rather sharply with the American uh, view of the world, the American self-understanding, which it owes a lot to Europe, of course, but, but is nonetheless uh, it's developed in, the, in an American context in its own way, which puts the individual uh, and the individual's rights and, and aspirations very clearly at the center of attention. And there is a difference between the two. And one of the challenges that we will all face, if I'm right about the emergence of China and America as the two great superpowers of the coming decades, is, is how those two very different and very deeply rooted worldviews engage with each other and come to terms with each other. What I wanted to do in, part of what I wanted to do in the book was to explore the way these different cultural perspectives, uh, and I, I could argue 
for the differences in Japan and in India and, and elsewhere too, um, have nonetheless some fascinating underlying human commonalities. And the way I did that, um, uh, in, in one of the chapters that I most enjoyed writing in that book, is to explore common human e expressions of common human experience. So the, the experience of joy, the experience of loss, bereavement, the experience of age and the sense of mortality and transience and those kinds of experiences and how those have been manifested in the great classical works of the different traditions. And so um, you look, for instance, um, at a poem written by a Chinese poet in about the year 800, so Tang Dynasty poet. Um, it's a lovely little sonnet on the death of his own three-year-old daughter. Um, and it just in a very almost prosaic terms describes how he goes out into the field to her little grave where she's buried and then muses on the fact that back home her bed is empty and the little bag that had her medicines in it is still hung over the bedstead and so on. And the point about this is this is this is China 1200 years ago. It, it could seem as far away as you could imagine from from our context here in Europe. And yet what he's expressing there is absolutely a universal, not culture bound, and b timeless. And there are, I, I, I could elaborate on this. There are numerous examples of that kind in the literatures um, and in the art, indeed, but particularly the literatures of these different traditions, which uh, which tell you that for all of the cultural differences that shape the way we think about the world, there are also some in underlying human commonalities, which is wonderful to discover. One of the things I suppose that um, is remarkable in the sort of uh, great canvas that you cover is, as you said, it, it isn't just a matter of Christianity and uh, Confucianism or Taoism, and because Eurasia also, we can't forget Hinduism, the various, various sorts, uh, forms of Buddhism, which are often quite different from each other within that one religion, as it were. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wonder. One of the things as well that you you you, you um, raise really is the question of how these um, not only relate to human emotion and experience in the way you've just been saying, but also in the way that uh, we might come upon values. So, did, would you like to say a little bit about where you think there might be common values? that come across these various cultural differences, and indeed where you think there are some that are quite clearly distinct? This is a, a, this is a profoundly important question, um, and it's complicated. Um, increasingly, um, well, let me, let me start this way. It, it, right after the Second World War, the United Nations produced a uh, Charter of Human Rights. Um, uh, it was produced by a committee um, chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of the president. Um, most of the, the drafting was done by a Canadian lawyer. Um, it's quite short. You, you can read it in 20 minutes. Um, it's surprisingly forward-looking in many ways. Uh, it talks about the, 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 the right to paid holidays from work, for instance. Um, uh, it certainly talks about the rights to education and uh, and, and various other things. Some, some of it's predictable and some of it was rather at the time and some of it was rather foresighted at the time. It had almost nothing in it about either cultural differences and the right to um, have uh, cultural expression of one's identity and also almost nothing about responsibilities. And I think that if you were um, redoing that now, um, we would all want to see much more reference to uh, responsibilities alongside the rights. I say that because that's the criticism that you hear quite a lot in various parts of Asia um, uh, and, in ver and, in, and, in, and in, indeed in the Islamic world, where, the, 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 where, where you will hear thoughtful uh, Islamic commentary saying there isn't enough there about your responsibilities within the family, for instance. Um, and it's a reminder, therefore, that uh, whilst I passionately believe there are universal human rights and, and the values that relate to those rights, um, you know, what, what is a good life, what, uh, what, what, it, what does lead to, 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 to human fulfillment, um, these are the values. And 
but but the more we reckon, recognize these different perspectives that are now becoming more vocal in recent decades, the more one realizes that this is a journey uh, of, of, of self-discovery by, by us human beings on a global scale. Um, so what are, what, are, what are the universally recognized values? Well, so, some are universally value, uh, recognized. And by the way, we have moved on from uh, an early, earlier times. Many cultures in the world, not just the Europeans, um, uh, slavery is the great scandal, the great shame on, on the historical record. Um, uh, the Black Lives Matter campaign has reminded us of just how uh, 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 outrageous and shameful it all was. Uh, but it wasn't, I don't, don't want to diminish this in any way, it wasn't only the Europeans that did this. Um, and you know, the Chinese had slaves, the uh, slaves, slavery was rife in the Islamic world, uh, and, and, and. Um, now none of us thinks that that's an acceptable thing. So you, understanding of what human rights are has moved on. Um, uh, this is a journey, and the, all of us, I think, would say we've got some way to go to, to fully understand about values and rights uh, and responsibilities. Um, I, for one, passionately believe that there are universals that we, that we need to discover in this, but we will discover them not by laying down the law from one side, so much as by dialogue, by engagement, by, work, by, by, by learning um, from the perspectives of others. Uh, and I do think um, that a Confucian world perspective um, has something to offer to, um, to to the broader world consciousness. I do think um, that some of the some of the remarkable Indian expressions of, uh, of 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 the sense of oneness with the with the with the wider cosmos have have much to teach the rest of us. Um, uh, and uh, we all of us are on a learning stage, both individually and as societies, um, and we've got some way to go. Uh, and if I can have one final thought on this, because the urgency of this is that we are, in addition to everything I've been saying in, in the last few minutes, uh, uh, confronted with some global challenges which we can only solve as a globally cooperative species. Um, I mean, we're living in the midst of a pandemic, for one thing, which is a reminder of that. Uh, perhaps more fundamentally and certainly more enduringly, the whole question of global warming or global heating, to give it what the names I think it really deserves, environmental degradation, um, with the threats that we pose to ourselves as a species, quite apart from the threat we pose to many other species, um, is something which is a common challenge for us all. So we better have discover, uh, work to discover the commonalities in, in the sense of what's important, what's valuable, what makes for sustainable and satisfying human existence, um, or else, uh, the outlook for our grandchildren ain't great. Thank you, Stephen. And, and uh, I would say to everyone now, we, we've covered an enormous amount of um, uh, ground here. Um, we, uh, uh, in my own mind, I can think of dozens of questions I'd like to ask, but can I encourage people, please do use the chat line on the, uh, um, the, the Zoom uh, to let us have some questions for the final part. Um, I, I've just got one last comment, Stephen, uh, before we move into the question and answer session. Uh, we'll look forward to hearing what people are going to ask. Uh, and that is that some years ago now, uh, John Habwood, who had been Archbishop of York, wrote a very interesting article which he called Too Many, wrong, uh, Too Many Rights Make a Wrong. And he was talking about human rights. Uh, it was a very good article, really. He was simply saying, that yes, of course, human rights are an essential part of the whole process. But in the end, starting and finishing with them is no way of actually um, furnishing a morality. Because in the end, morality needs to start from where we, what we owe to each other, as it were, and how we respond to each other, rather than a series of sort of edicts, which have been somehow derived by whatever process. I just want your comment on that. Right. I think I essentially agree with it. Um, the, uh, um, um, yeah, the, we, if, if we perceive our, the purpose of human life to be self-fulfillment, and there's nothing else to be said than that, uh, we do then naturally think about rights rather than responsibilities. 
the moment we recognize the, the, the much the, the truth that, that human self-fulfillment comes through a sense of engagement with and responsibility for others um, is the moment when we recognize um, that just talking about our own rights uh, isn't sufficient um, if we want to reach an understanding of what constitutes the good life. Uh, the, the, you know, different people have a different ways of thinking about the good life. Um, so some will come at, many will come at that from a religious perspective, many will not. Um, both Aristotle and Confucius, neither of whom were naturally, I suspect, religious in, in the sense that we would understand the term, um, uh, had, had a vision of the good life, which was surprisingly similar, actually, in, and thereby, and therein lies a source of some encouragement, that when, when people do start to ask those kinds of questions, you do tend to find people groping for answers that, that, that look quite similar in a sense. And that therein, as I say, I think is the hope that, that the journey will, 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 uh, uh, is heading towards a destination which we need it to head to. Thank you. Well, we, we'll, we'll, we're going to move on to just a second now, I think, to uh, um, some questions and answers. I've got, there's one question already here um, in relation to China and Taiwan, which is a thing that the newspapers like to keep reminding us of. I wonder if you, uh, if you could respond to this, this question we've just had. Um, well, it, it, Taiwan uh, is... Um, is in an odd st status, of course. There are very few countries left in the world that formally recognize Taiwan as an independent country. Um, there are one or two, um, but, but, but essentially none. Uh, from China's point of view, it's a renegade province, um, and China's long-term objective is clearly to have the renegade province become part of, uh, part of the uh, People's Republic of China. Uh, they'd like to achieve that peacefully. Um, um, they see this as a long game. Um, they, I think, would react very, uh, very um, uh, sharply to any declaration of independence by Taiwan. Um, Taiwan's a very successful society and economy. Um, uh, I think there are um, rising dangers of something going wrong in the kind of triangle between uh, the mainland, Hong Kong and Taiwan. Um, and uh, if this were to explode into some kind of military confrontation, we will all know about it. So we, we better hope that uh, the, the, the status quo, which is in, essentially in everybody's interests, lasts as long as possible. But it's an unresolved position on the world stage and, and unresolved positions always have the potential to suddenly become explosive. Stephen, now the questions are now pouring in. Um, the first one was something I, I feel rather guilty. I didn't really talk much uh, at all about the fact that you're also an ordained priest uh, within the Church of England. Um, and Sue is asking, did you find your job hindered by being ordained in the church? Um, the short answer is, uh, at one level, the answer is no. Um, it, it, the, 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 let, it's perhaps worth just explaining a bit about how that came about. Um, I, I uh, was living in Hong Kong at the time when I put myself forward for uh, what was then called non-stipendary minister. Um, was a, I forget what the, but there's a, a more up-to-date phrase for it now. Uh, <laughs> I.e., I had no, uh, I had no sense that I was called to be uh, a full-time professional clergy like yourself. Um, uh, that that wasn't what I sensed was what I was being drawn to. Um, and I met a couple of people, both in Hong Kong and also, in fact, there was a chap visiting from Britain at the time who encouraged me to pursue this. Uh, and so I went ahead and I got accepted um, uh, as an ordinand, as a candidate, did the training. I did the training by remote control from the, uh, the Northern, Ordin Northern Ordination course based in Manchester. Um, and then ever since then, so this is now 30 years, I've been a kind of fifth wheel um, in terms of um, supporting the, the, the parish life where I live, um, taking, taking the occasional service. I used to do quite a lot of it, uh, a bit less frequently now, um, um, but uh, I've, I've always in, found that rewarding and it's given me some very precious experiences. Um, I've, uh, take, taking the, uh, just one example, I will never forget taking the funeral of a child who was killed uh, in a road accident uh, 
uh, for the family. I mean, what a what a what a responsibility that was. Um, uh, did, 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 it, did the fact of being ordained, which I've never concealed, um, I've never blown the trumpet about it, I've never concealed it, did that um, impact on my career? No, I don't think it did. Um, um, is it the case that calling yourself a Christian um, and indeed being prepared publicly to do so, we should all be, if, if you do, you have to be prepared to be public about it if called upon to do so, that, that, does that place an obligation on you? Yes, of course it does. Does it place uncomfortable challenges on you? Yes, of course it does. Uh, but I don't think they're different because because I was an ordained person than, 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 than it would be for anybody who want, wants to say I am a Christian. Thank you very much. Now, there are three or four questions here, so I'll try and take them fairly swiftly so people will have a chance for their question to be asked. Carol says she agrees about seeking um, and understanding human commonalities as being vital. Some of us strive to do this for ourselves and share with others. How do you think it can be best achieved at the speed and depth we now so urgently need, uh, politically and otherwise? Gosh. I think, that's, I think that's a very hard question to answer. Um, I mean, I, you, you can't wave a magic wand about this. I, 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 I just encourage people to do it, so, i.e. I, to spend a bit of time in their reading. Um, maybe there's a, a discussion group to join. Um, um, some people have a, a, a real um, aptitude for learning languages. I mean, some of the languages we're talking about are pretty difficult ones. And so uh, you kind of, unless you've started a long way earlier in life than I am at, it's a bit too late. And hence I said a few moments ago, the idea of having a, you know, I, thought, I wish I was a cat with nine lives because I know what I'd use a few of the other ones for. It, it's, it, it, so there, there are the kind of challenges about it. The, 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 what I want to put in the other side of the scales is this is exciting. It's it's fun. It's interesting. Uh, you discover all sorts of fascinating things. If you, if you like reading literature or like reading poetry, say, try the, try the Chinese poets. The good there are good English translations around. Try Hafez, the famous Iranian poet from the Middle Ages, whose effervescent love of life is 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 transparent even even in well, in a good English translation. I don't read Arabic. I wish I did. Um, um, but you uh, no, actually, it's because he, he didn't write in Arabic. He wrote in in Persian, um, but in Arabic script. Um, the, um, the the it's wonderfully exuberant poetry. So you, there's a lot of there's a lot to be there's a lot of fun to be had in doing it. Now, quite different again, uh, um, Stephen from, from Richard. He, he's asking. Uh, he's he's interested to hear your view on how the availability of instant global communication has an impact on cultural diversity? I think that's a, I think it has a huge impact. And we all know so much more about each other than we did even 50 years ago, let alone 100, um, let alone 200. Um, you know, 200 years ago, um, edu intellectual Europeans, educated Europe, figures like Goethe, and, and, uh, and Wordsworth and people like that were beginning to understand something of both the, 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 the both, both the creativity of the Islamic world and also of the Chinese and Indian worlds. Um, but it was at the early beginnings, and that's only 200 years ago. And I think even, you know, e even, even if you go back to 1950, just after the Second World War, the knowledge of, of the way other people tick was pretty superficial. So it's changing fast and global communications up until the pandemic, lots of travel, um, quite how that will pan out <laughs> uh, 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 as, as we get through the pandemic, we'll, we will see. Um, but it's hard to think that it's going completely into reverse. And the, and the truth is that we now live in a world of virtual connectivity, which means we just do know more about each other. Um, this raises... Um, some of the we, we've seen the dangers. We've seen the dangers in hate crime, in 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 uh, in uh, um, uh, fundamentalist terror attacks, in in um, all sorts of trivial insults and, uh, and and ways in which people seek to kind of rope themselves off from being challenged by the the other with a capital O. Um, but there's also the enormous richness that comes from the engagement and our great hope must be that the richness of the engagement outweighs the fears 
uh, uh, the, the, the perceived threats to one's own personal identity that so many people do have. Thank you. And then uh, Brian um, is asking, he says, morality has always been an issue in business, but do you think that the rise of blatantly untruthful world leaders has exacerbated the problem? Um, I think that, yes, I do. Um, uh, I mean, I, let's not get into some very topical American politics. Uh, uh, I mean, perhaps not just American politics. Uh, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very unattractive um, symbiosis between politicians who want to be elected and a media that loves good stories. Um, I um, remember reading, this back in August, I remember reading an article by one quite well-known British media commentator, I, I think I probably won't name him, uh, it was an article in, in I think, The Times, um, complaining about how politicians never properly answer the question um, and how frustrating it was that you could never get a straight answer out of a politician on so many questions. And, and uh, you know, one, one reading that article, you, you, we, knew, we know exactly what, what he means. Um, but viewed from the other side of the desk, you can see what the problem is too. I and mean, if you were a politician and you know that um, you've got an aggressive media um, uh, cross-questioning where they don't let you finish your sentence, they'll pick one particular phrase out of context, um, uh, and, they're, and they're not above inventing stuff either. Um, uh, you can see how this is a sort of actually a really rather problematic uh, encounter. And I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. Um, uh, we, we live, one of, one of the, we, we've talked about values and rights, we haven't talked about freedoms. And I think one of the basic freedoms we do have, and we should not, uh, we should never take for granted or take lightly, is the freedom of expression. Um, so you want a vibrant media, um, and you recognise how uh, how many uh, injustices and, and dark spots in society are exposed by the light of the media being shone on them. Um, but at the same time, nobody could pretend uh, that the the, 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 the the media commentary and the media rhetoric um, is at all perfect, and, and, and it is so often unconstructed and dangerous, and creates its own tendency for the politicians to react accordingly. So this is a complicated question. Of now, course, um, there are well, where 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 people say, "Well, we told you so." This is the trouble with too much open democratic uh, um, uh, process, and with a bit <laughs> less of that, and you have a more orderly society. Uh, that doesn't feel like quite the right answer either. No, I agree. Yeah. Um, now, I'm trying to make sure that we have a chance for each person who's asked a question to have at least one of their questions asked. So my apologies if not all the questions get uh, get, get through. But uh, David is saying, are many of the cultural values not ultimately incompatible? Um, you, you can certainly think of some values that would be incompatible. I think... Uh, I, I, I think I believe that deep down, the, the, the values that relate to what makes for, for, the, for, for human good, for human fulfillment, are not incompatible. Um, and I think there is enough evidence across cultures of that being true. Um, but to be clear, uh, I do not mean by that that any one culture has got all of the answers, and nor do I believe that any, any one culture is static in its view of the world. I, I mentioned slavery as an example where I think the whole world has moved on to, uh, from, from earlier understandings of what, what behavior was appropriate to what we would now think uh, as appropriate. If you go a lot further back in human history, uh, uh, it, you know, the, the evidence is that in uh, this is anthropological evidence of, of you know, human sacrifice as being an appropriate means of of, of, of of keeping the gods quiet. Well, nobody thinks that that's an appropriate form of behavior now. So one way or another, you can find evidence of, of progress. Um, uh, I, I think in the case of Britain, if we pitched ourselves back even into the 1970s, never mind earlier than that, I think we'd be shocked by how racist, sexist and classroom it all seems to be. Um, now, many of us would say it's still racist, classist, and, and, and uh, 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 classroom and sexist. Um, but I think we'd also be reminded by going back to the 1970s that we have actually travelled a fair distance in a, in a positive direction since. 
So it's a journey, but do I think there's a fundamental incompatibility between the human self-understandings that you find around these different cultures that we've been talking about? I think I want to say in the end, no, I don't think there's a fundamental incompatibility. And we, it is our job to explore and discover. Thank you. Now, there's another question from Carol, which is rather different from the, any of the other ones I think we've had so far. But she says, even without, um, uh, I think she put me, even within our own country at present, there's a growing divergence of how we handle the uh, COVID and the pandemic uh, and the uh, and sacrificing for the sake of all. How can we address this growing divergence? Well, <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> We're in the midst of it, and uh, it, and it's very clear that that, that um, government, who uh, you know, I, do, do, I don't want to get into talking about. Do I think the government's record has or hasn't been what it might have been in handling COVID? What is clear is that people have been having to make it up as they go along to a considerable extent. I mean, this is a phenomenon that um, it, the first time for a hundred years that you've had anything like a pandemic. Well that you've had a pandemic of the scale. We've actually had, had pandemics uh, more recently than that, but the Spanish flu after the First World War was the last time a very serious explosion of, of viral infection occurred. Um, uh, and at that time, of course, they knew far less than we do now. And, and, and even now that we know more than we did then, um, um, uh, there have been egregious failures, as I think you know, everybody would now recognise, that uh, the care home crisis wasn't well handled, to say the least. Um, uh, lack of preparation. It's a, we can say all of that. Um, what, I th I, what I think is difficult, I think it's difficult at the moment to assess what the enduring effects of all this will be. And I think you probably need another five or even 10 years to be in a position to look back on the COVID-19 experience um, and see how that has what divisions in society is exposed? Well, actually, we know that it's, it's exposed and exacerbated some of the social and economic divisions that we know of. What we don't know is how much human behaviour will be changed permanently by it. Will, for instance, the, the travel, the, the, the huge amount of travel that we've all been doing, this is, I'm talking as much leisure travel, really, rather than business travel in this context, will that resume and get back to what it norm, what was before? Uh, what happens to the way people behave? Um, is this is this something that will, um, will 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 pass over the next couple of years? And we'll look back in ten years' time to 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 a period that felt like, like a nightmare in the midst of it, but will not have left an enduring uh, um, uh, impact on human behaviour. I don't know, and I, sus I suspect that the the, that the experts whom the government is constantly uh, uh, consulting they don't know either. I suspect. Steve, thank you very much indeed. I think um, uh, if I allow myself one more question, and we're running out of time, but my question is a very simple one. Having produced this amazing um, uh, canvas that we've been looking at today in the Human Odyssey, are you still inclined to want to write anything else? Um, <laughs> don't know. <laughs> I, I, the thing I probably won't ever be able to do um, would be to do what I did on, and really enjoy doing on Germany, to do that for Japan. They're, they're, they're two countries that have got some obvious 20th century parallels. Um, and the parallels are not just uh, to do with the war. Um, they're actually obvious 19th century parallels too, the, the, the process of modernization, um, the, pro, the, the, the speed of their emergence on the world stage in the late 19th century and early 20th. Um, so, so uh, the, the richness of the literary tradition, the, the Japanese, uh, we're, we're somewhat familiar with the Germans, generally less than the but Japanese novels are extraordinary. Um, I, I've never read them in Jap Japanese, sadly, um, but, but they are very powerful works of literature. And to have had a little bit of experience of that has been a great pleasure for me. The, the Japanese, by the way, produced the oldest, by some centuries, the oldest novel in the world. Um, and that is an extraordinary read, the tale of Genji. If you do nothing else to, to, to start to, to, to address the Japanese phenomenon, read a good English translation of the tale of Genji. It's like a kind of Jane Austen of, of, of a thousand years ago. Um, and uh, uh, it's extraordinary. That's a very good challenge with which to end, I think. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, you and I can follow this up at some other point, of course. But uh, 
Um, to everyone else, thank you so much for listening to what I think you'll all agree has been an extraordinarily rich um, reflection from Stephen. Um, and perhaps I could just say to people, um, uh, organising a festival like this it does cost money. So we'd be really grateful if people could contribute something towards the cost of it. Um, and, and that will help us make sure that next year's festival is as good and perhaps even better. Thank you so much um, uh, for joining us. Perceive and thank you once again. Pleasure. Thank you.